Hello there. We have got a great chat today on separate bathrooms. Please know we do cover some serious topics, including mental health and suicide. If these topics raise any issues for you, please contact Lifeline on 13 11 14 or visit lifeline.org.au or Beyond Blue on 1800 224 636 or visit beyondblue.org.au. The men's groups that were around were pointing towards just that social engagement and with the men's team it was a really good opportunity to get together a group of guys who were willing to explore their masculinity and the emotional side of them. Hello and welcome back to Separate Bathrooms. We would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay our respects to the elders, both past and present. Here is my husband, Cam Dado. <laughs> Thank you, wife. Dun, 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 dun. Ellie Dado. <laughs> okay, Maurice Harvey Hall is a mindset architect, a meditation teacher, and a spiritual mentor. His journey's taken him to many parts of the world, seeking and finding knowledge, along with many areas of the inner world, being the mind and spirit. He studied various psychotherapies. He's a registered nurse specializing in mental health. Maurice has spoken on the TEDx stage and studied Taoist. Taoist? Did I Taoist? say that right? Taoist? Or Taoist? <laughs> Taoist. Yeah. Taoist. <laughs> Philosophy and Buddhist psychology and has a passion for neuroscience. Maurice and I met through My Men's Health Charity, My Men's Team, which he now holds the position of mind fitness coach. He's a ripping bloke. Please welcome to the bathroom, Maurice Harvey Hall. Maurice, I have to introduce myself because I've heard so much about you, but um, we haven't never met. So I'm Cam's wife, Ali. <laughs> Hello, Ali. Um, Hi. I am aware of you. So I'm uh, sure. I'm sure you've heard all the horrible things about me. <laughs> <laughs> he only ever speaks of you in such a, a loving, compassionate way, I can say. Aww, that's very nice. That's very nice. It's nice to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, mate. <laughs> you can and, pay him later, right? Yeah. And that's welcome. Right, yeah. And welcome to the bathroom. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Hey, it's your month. It's Movember. And I say Movember because I know you as Maurice and, and I've we've known each other, as I said in the in the intro, which you didn't hear, uh, for quite a few years since I started the men's team. That's how we connected. Yeah. Um and um and I know that you go by the name of Mo, so I think it's really cool that, that it's Movember. It's, it's your month, buddy. Yeah. yeah. And as I said, welcome. Uh, it's great to have you here. Um, in your opinion, mate, what, what is the biggest challenge men face in dealing with their emotions? Uh, I think that in the space that, that I'm working in, even with my own emotions, is, is actually um, feeling the emotion first. And, and then not wanting to run away from it. Mm. So I've got this thing called an emotion um, and I naturally want to run, run away from it because it may not necessarily feel good or I'll have a, you know, maybe a negative cognition around it. I shouldn't feel that, you know, that sort of thing. And if you can sit with it a little bit longer than running away from it, even if it's just for a couple of seconds, uh, to identify what the emotion is, you know, give it a name in a sense. And, mm. and then if you want to go even further than that is to then wonder where that emotion came from. You know, uh, things don't just happen randomly. Um, you know, things are connected. There's an interconnectedness with, um, with life. And, and this is your body. And, and what we also find is that um, not only men, but, um, you know, I think human beings is we, we live most of our lives in our heads and we forget that we've got a body and we forget that the mind and the body are connected. So the body's really trying to communicate with you about your thoughts. And um, I think naturally it's just it's um, wanting to get away from it. And whether that wanting to get away from it is related to uh, conditioning of the past, you know, mm -hmm. um, to, to be a man, you know, you know, men don't cry, you know, don't show vulnerability, this real stoic 
um, nature that we've been, um, in a sense, conditioned to believe that this is appropriate and then that's not appropriate. Mm. Mm. How long have you been working with clients, Maurice? Well, I'm a mental health nurse. I've been nursing for nearly 15, 16 years. Yeah. Um, before that, I was a landscaper by trade and I worked in casinos. So, um, <laughs> quite the change. But so yeah, probably still had to do yeah. a lot of mental health, health in that landscaping that's, too. But. That's right. Yeah. So, the, the landscaping was nurturing, the, the casinos yeah. and hospitality was communicating. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice yeah. way to put it. Yeah. And, and negotiating as well. Right. Um, and then nursing was the negotiating, communicating with the nurturing. So we're definitely seeing a shift in um, the feeling about talking about our mental health. I feel like we're coming out of the shadows about about you know it being a shameful thing to talk about or being embarrassed about having depression or whatever is going on for us. In the years that you've you have. I mean, even just been alive or, or, or just in your work, have you noticed an involvement particularly in men coming forward and sharing their mental health? Yeah, definitely. Um, as much as there's a conditioning, there's also been uh, an awakening mm. um, and probably the awakening of uh, mental health. Um, it's been more uh, in mainstream media uh, and a lot more, I guess, programs and advertising around it. I think for men too, you know, we're, we're starting to see that, you know, more men are committing suicide than women. So there was yeah. this sense of, okay, there's, um, it, it's, not, it's not a balanced um, approach. So what's, what's happening for the men as well mm. too? Mm. Um, you know, I sit in the, you know, um, you know, back in the old days, it was a snag, you know, sensitive new age guy. You, you know, that, like I sort of grew up in, in that era. And I'm with you, buddy. I was there too. Someone yeah, yeah. That once. That, that, that's what the whole men's thing's about anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this development of um, maybe men challenging the status quo and maybe wanting to be maybe a little bit more authentic, um, Look, even in saying that, I just caught up with somebody last week and he's as bushy as you can get and yet was recognising that he was some, you know, his uh, alcohol was increasing, his family was concerned about him and he was ruminating about stuff that had happened, you know, 30, 40 years ago. And, and now he's here to, um, to, 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 to speak about it. And I also find too being in the health industry and, and, and being in psychotherapy and counselling, there's some really beautiful uh, talk therapies and different modalities of healing these days that people can unburden their, their traumas and unburden those things that they've been holding on to. So mm -hmm. I, I find the whole ecosystem is moving towards more of a, a, a healing process rather than... Yeah this stoic just suck it up and move on i think mm. i think we're changing as as humanity as well too mm. you, you you mentioned before that the mind and the body are not for most people are not communicating with each other so are you saying when you say that that the trauma that we hold within our body or can be alleviated by working on your mental health yeah, definitely. I'd say that the, the, your, your mental health is related to um, these traumas in the body. You know, there's a lot of research around, um, you know, the, the, the body holds the score, the pain body. You know, Eckhart Tolle talks about that a lot too. Um, just, just think about, you know, we, we do a lot of breath work um, within the, the, the meditation centre and you, you store your emotions through your breath. So, you know, when, you have, when you're in shock, see how your breath is... It, yeah. it reacts yeah. in a particular way. So yeah. here it is, you know, when I'm angry, this breath's different. When I'm sad, when I'm brokenhearted. So our emotions are impacted within the breath. The breath impacts these emotions within the body. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of evidence and a lot of movements around um, uh, somatic work these days where we're working with the body and the mind. And... Mm. Um, and if we're not working with the body and the mind, we're probably going to see the side effects of it in our mental health. See, it's, it's, I don't think it's a chicken or the egg type of thing. I think they're quite symbiotic uh, within nature that 
if there's mental health um, experiences or conditions happening for people, can I inquire into the body? Can I inquire into the mind? Um, as I start to inquire into that, I then bring a greater awareness of it to the system and at least then I can, uh, it can be seen. And when it's seen, then maybe we can then start to do something with it as well. Yeah. Makes sense. We're having a lot, um, I teach at a school and, it, and that sort of is really being implemented in a lot of ways about where do you feel the feeling in your body? Like if, are you, you know, if a child comes to school and they're sad, where do you feel yeah. it in your body? And I think it's such a beautiful way to teach children about it's, a bi- it's bigger than just what's in your head. And even if they can't express what's going on, if they can say my tummy hurts or my head hurts or it's just, it's just, it's so important, I think, to encompass the whole body, the whole experience when we're talking about feelings. Yeah, and, and beautiful to bring it into, um, into childhood conversations as well. You know, in, in, the, in the men's group, you know, we might say what's arising, uh, what's alive in you, or you know, what's cooking, that sort of thing. Um, you, know, we can, you can really tap into the body because the body is, you know, is, is letting you know it's, it's, um, it's mm-hmm. speaking to you in that way. And I think it's beautiful that you've got this opportunity to, to speak to um, our younger generations, our children, about becoming aware. Um, you know, in, in a meditation perspective, we call it um, embodiment. You know, we're, we are all of this. And um, mm-hmm. this whole system is constantly communicating and speaking to us. And... Uh, and so many times we, um, we, we ignore it, we, we push it down, we suppress it, and, um, and ultimately it'll, it'll come out somewhere. You know, the system yeah. can only handle a certain amount of pressure before it, mm. it comes out of one of these orifices in, in some way, you know, that sort of thing. Mm. Oh, that's, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> don't, well, don't. I'm not. You don't even know not, where I'm my not husband's going mind is. <laughs> I know there. this is separate bathrooms that. and orifices. <laughs> and sort of the game, right? <laughs> yeah, we've had too many fart conversations on this podcast. We, we can't go there again, <laughs> well, can If you we? can't fart in a bathroom, where can you fart? <laughs> that's <laughs> actually yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Just say, look, that must I, be your pain body that's expressing itself. See, that's, that's probably <laughs> yeah. it. Honey, you must be in pain a lot. I am, and better out than in. That's what I say. <laughs> Hey, well, we are celebrating um, and put, shining a light on men's emotional, mental, spiritual, physical health this month being Movember. Yes. Um, Mo, what can uh, our, our females, the opposite sex, do when our men and our boys are struggling? How can they best be supported? That's a really good question, Cam. Um, My wife wrote that. Okay. I can't take it. <laughs> All right. So uh, I can speak from my own personal experience, and I don't know if I can speak for men generally. However, oh. I am a man, and I'm aware of um, being a human being as well as being a man, that oh. there's a process that's really important when a person is experiencing ruptures. So whether those ruptures are interpersonally or intrapersonally, and that's the witnessing process. So the witnessing process is that um, I see you, I hear you, and you matter. And when a person feels that way, whether it's a man or I'm imagining a woman feels that way, uh, then, you know, they're connected to something that, that... that pain that they may be going through, it's, it's now, it's acknowledged and it's seen. And what, what does it mean to be seen and heard? Well, you know, I, I see that um, something's going on for you. You know, so just that acknowledgement. Would you mind sharing what that is? And, and I think, you know, because you were asking this question from a female to a male perspective, um, I can speak from a male to a female perspective that we men, in a generalised term, want to fix things. So, you know, we can yeah. see something's happening and, and here's this information, oh, this is how you fix it, whereas I think it's good for men to learn just to listen. I think women mm-hmm. are probably better at listening than, than men are. And so I think they naturally do that better. So I see you, um, I hear you, and I'm listening to your concerns. So if someone comes to you, Maurice, who is a 
say it's a man and he's like, I'm, I'm totally fine. My wife just wants me to come to you because I'm having angry outbursts, but you know, I have, I, I don't want to talk about anything and I'd rather just go to the pub with my mates. Where do you start with that? <laughs> <laughs> I know well, it's a big I, question. <laughs> actually, I've I've had a couple of people like that. I'd, I'd like to say that I don't. Uh, yet they're they're there, um, possibly out of duress rather than their own. Mm. Mm. Uh, and and really straight up, it it suggests that you're in for a bit of a tough ride. And um, is that you or the client? Uh, me as me as the therapist. Mm. I, th- I think probably what I've done in the past is, well, uh, I just want to acknowledge it. You probably don't necessarily want to be here. You don't think that there's anything happening um, for you and it's more about your wife. Uh, you know, while you are here, can I just get to know you? And yeah, that's good. It, right. So it's just mm. trying to um, acknowledge so once again, see, there's that witness thing. I see you and I hear you, and and you do matter. So so here you are, and um, and while you're here, you now what would you like to talk about? Um, if there's anything that you want to talk about, what interests you? That because sort of there has to, there has to be an opening for them, doesn't it? For to get in, you know, there has to be some kind of softening around that in order yeah. to yeah. have a healing. I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because you know when um, you know. If you feel seen and you feel heard, then you feel validated. When you're validated, that promotes trust. And where there's trust, then you can then inquire into somebody. So there's a, a sequence that, you know, we need to create, in a sense, before we start to inquire. Yeah. Um, and, and that happens with, with most people that I see. Most people know who they're coming to and why they're coming to me for that. They've already developed trust through social media or seeing posts or, or referrals, you know, so I don't have to do that part. But for others, I was told to come here and, you know, oh, okay, what are you here for? You know, that, that sort of thing. So um, Yeah. Yeah. I, I seem to remember early on in my therapy journey being a bit like being bit that guy going, I have no freaking clue why I'm here. I'm okay. You know, and then, and then probably the therapist did what you did. I see you. I hear you. I acknowledge you. And I'm su- and, the, and suddenly, oh, everything starts to crack. <laughs> and yeah. You walk out of there an hour later going, Ooh, I'll see you next week. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And we're going to the pub. So, you know, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> you still right. get the pub in. Hey, yeah. question for you. Um, do we, do we, do men and women have different emotional needs or, or do we have a different way of going about getting the same needs met? Wow. That's a good question. Uh, I remember that book, you know, um, is it uh, men, you know, women? Mars are, and Venus? Um, yeah, men yeah. Are, men yeah. are from Mars, women are from Venus, yeah. 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 Um, I definitely feel as though that there's both masculine and feminine energies held within each person, no matter mm. if you're a man or a woman. Um, there'll be a, um, a different percentage that might sit in it. So men might be 70% masculine, 30% feminine, you know, mm. and it could shift, you know, and, and people are very different. I do also believe that there's um, – that feminine energy is very different to masculine energy and each of those energies require um, uh, particular things to feel satiated to feel mm. satisfied. So in that, then there could be that men require different emotional needs than women just because of the makeup of their masculine and their feminine uh, energies. Yeah? And, and, you know, uh, looking at yin and yang, you know, yang is very masculine and yin is very feminine. You know, yin is, um, is receptive. Um, it holds, it's a container. Um, you know, uh, yang is very um, there's movement oriented, you know that sort of oh, thing. Okay. So there is difference that sits within it, and for men, and and also too, you know, and this is something I found just recently, which I I thought oh, that just makes so much sense. You know, I think you guys have spoken about love language. Yeah, yeah. So what I found and it was that the love languages 
that we um, that we give to another is what we would like to receive. You know, so mine's mm. a you know physical touch is important to me, quality time and, and words of affirmation. You know, so I'm giving others you know uh, words of affirmation, physical touch, and things like that. And so I'd like to receive it. The reason why we give it to others is because we didn't receive that in our early childhood years. So hmm. your love language could then give you an indicator of what your emotional needs are because we're seeking from others what we didn't receive early on in our, in, in our attachment styles within, um, within our early developmental years. So that was, you know, I, I, I didn't find it surprising. I thought, oh, that resonates with me. And it might resonate totally. with you and, and some of your viewers and it may not with others, you know, but it's just something yeah. to consider that the reason why I want this is because mm. I didn't get it. We're frozen. And, um, and I know how important it is for me to receive it because of the, in a sense, the lack or the contrast of it when in the early. So that could relate to emotion. Does, does that ring true for you, honey? Your love language is touch. Mm. Is that something you didn't have a lot of in your look i don't i don't know i you know part of me wants to protect my mum and dad yeah five so, siblings though honestly, yeah yeah but I, if i look at it i go oh no everything was great um so th as you say there were, w there were five kids in our family and only just mum and dad and dad was working a lot you know especially during the week so mum had to share her small physicality with five kids. So probably, probably didn't get as much as I, mm. as I would have wanted. I'm not really, uh, look, I'm going to tell, I, I was going to lie then. So I'm not really aware of it. I am very aware of it. <laughs> <laughs> do I want more cuddles? I always want more cuddles. <laughs> do, yes. Do I want more physicality? I always want it. Did, was it not there when I was a kid? Maybe. I'm not sure. No, yeah, and that isn't any judgment on your mum at all. I yeah. mean, as 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 you've said before, five kids under the age of seven, that's you don't have enough. Plus, you've got twin boys right in after you. I mean, that's a lot of time needing to spend on those children. Yeah, well, as a father and knowing how much Lotus River and Bodhi needed as yeah. little kids uh, in terms of attention and physical love and all that sort of stuff, I know that. I was not two years old and mum had twins. So yeah. she needed to take care of the twins. And I was probably offloaded to my grandma and, and a sandbox, you know, yeah. which I do know about yeah. that, you know. So I think a lot of my imagination came from those, those early formulative years. But yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Mm. That what we, what you're saying, Maurice, is that what we don't get as a kid, we look for as an adult. We've actually heard that that idea that what you do as a child to survive will ultimately destroy you as an adult, mm. right? I, I mean, yeah, those and those early childhood development years are just so important that yeah, we're, and we're really just coming to an understanding of how significant they are now. You know, mm. normally it takes about you know, thirty to forty years before uh, research is you know coming out to then go, oh, you know, that stuff that happened to you or didn't happen to you 40 years ago and you're aware of that that era um, yeah. that was really important and now we're finding out about it now and, and you go, oh well, maybe that's contributed to the way that I am that's why I seek this out you know that's why mm. um, I get upset with this or you know it's, mm. um, it's quite revealing and, and I think this generation uh, is really you know coming back to your question before Ali about um, you know, are we starting to see a shift within men's mental health and things like that? And I think, well, yes, we are, because we're starting to see all of this evidence and data coming out from the past that suggests that, um, right. that these things are important, you know. So maybe that's right. where the shift is. It's, we get this lag time within our research and evidence-based mm -hmm. practice. I read this morning, uh, I've actually heard this story before, but I read it again in the paper about a fellow in San Francisco, he jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge in an attempt to kill himself and he hit the water and there was a sea lion and the sea lion pushed him up to the surface. He was broken, he broke a lot of bones, but the sea lion actually pushed him up to the surface and he survived the fall. He's now goes to, now he teaches about living life and now he is about, yeah, anti-suicide and, and, and men's health. Um, was there something cataclysmic 
for you in your life and your mental health that made you want to go into this field? Beautiful story. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think for me it was more so trying to understand self. I would say that at the age of 28 I had a midlife crisis. Um, I was very ego-driven. I had many hats that I would wear and many roles and um, I was just I was trying to be everything for everybody. So I grew up as a people pleaser mm. and that was... Uh, hey there. Like, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, what I guess so, yeah, me too, probably. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not sustainable, you know. Nope. Um, yeah. And... I think I got to that point where, and, and that's where, you know, I contemplated suicide at um, 28. I think I've contemplated suicide maybe four times since then. Um, mm. And I became more and more aware of why I was thinking that way um, rather than I shouldn't be, this is wrong, there must be something wrong with me. It was more like, oh, that's interesting. And so as I started to become more and more aware um, I think I ultimately wanted to find out about me. Well, why, why do I do this stuff? So it was more so a personal, I don't know, self-development journey than mm. more so I need to go and help men. Now, in saying that, because I was developing myself, what I found was that, especially within the men's groups, was that the men's groups that were around were... Uh, you know, like the men's shed, um, you know, you had mates for mates, which is more so, you know, um, military, that sort of stuff. But there was, it was more so they were pointing towards just that camaraderie and social engagement and not necessarily about emotional intelligence. Mm. And that's where, I guess, with the men's team, it was a really good opportunity to... Um, get together a group of guys who were willing to explore their masculinity and also the emotional side of them. And I think that's where I, you know, that, that's where I'm sitting in at the moment with, within that nation and also part of Cam's, Cam's group as well too. So I think it was just, it, it, it was the right time because there was many times within my life I tried to, in a sense, come closet of um mental health and, and and holistic thinking and things like that. But the, the, the community that I was in just wasn't ready to hear it, so I'd yeah. back in and I'll, I'll keep it quiet, whereas um, now there does seem to be a, a greater awareness and a, a acceptability around mm -hmm. men getting together. And, um, yeah, we started the, the – I call it a movement. It's a men's movement, and it was about empowering men. Mm -hmm. um, there there'd been so many um, – so many groups, you know, for, for women to get together and empowering women, mm. and uh, I just didn't see that happening for men, and not empowering men in a toxic way, um, more so uh, inviting, uh, you know, that emotional intelligence and communication, and and from using those as the foundations, you know, communicating oneself, uh, what what is this, and it comes back to that first question of you know from Cam that you know. What what are the challenges that you know, men deal with emotions? Well, you know, they're in here, and how do I communicate it to somebody else? Mm. You you're you're well documented um, at having kicked a uh, a fifteen year addiction to pot. Yes. Yeah. Um. How did you do that? I mean, how do you how do you kick addiction? How you know is there without going to AA or any of those sort of? Can you do it on your own, or do you need support? Oh, look, I, and I think, um, you know, different folks, different strokes. Um, mm. I've worked in um, rehabs. So I've gone in, you know, on, on a weekly basis doing mindset stuff. Um, some people, rehabs are really important because they need to be taken out of their environment, step out of their environment, um, move into a controlled environment and, um, and be supported in that way. Yeah. Uh, others can do it on their own. Um, How did you do it? I, I swapped my addiction for triathlon. Ah. So uh, I, I, I run by the premise that you never give up anything, you only replace it with something else. Yeah, right. right. 
So I then used my addictive personality in triathlon. And, it, you know, if I'm going to get engrossed or obsessive about something, then do it for your health. Now, in saying that, I've seen many marriages break down because of triathlon. I've seen people get lost in it, in that bubble. Mm. So it doesn't necessarily suggest that it's a better addiction. You know, it's just more so um, maybe for some people it was more um, I, can, I can put that down and I can pick this up and while I'm picking this up I can still continue to learn about myself. Um, I, I think the other thing too is that uh, for us to let something go of value, an addiction has value because of you know, the big reason why people do something, I need to go to a place that has greater value. Mm. And so I created greater value within triathlon, the social stuff and the health stuff, and, and that's how I then started to fix it. Yeah. Mm. I do want to say, first of all, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show, on, on the podcast. Uh, there, there is a book out, it's called The Art of Intentional Living, which you can get at, on, on Maurice's uh, website. Um, we'll give that information in our show notes, mate. And, um, and just, it's such a pleasure. And I'm so glad that our listeners and Al have had a chance to hear what the privilege that I get to be around you with through my men's team. Um, and being our mind fitness coach, we're so grateful to have you on board because your wisdom is, is wonderful. And the way you assist us is so gentle and kind and quiet. And it's the epitome of soft words sink in and, and, and you have that and bless you. Oh, Maurice, as Cam said, you know, it's it's so lovely to have you here for the month of November and sharing your wisdom. And it's so lovely to finally get to meet you. So I've heard such wonderful things about you. So really grateful that you came on the podcast to share what you think and what you feel. And, and hopefully some of these words will help someone out there today. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you for, um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much for um, arranging all of this. And look, I just have to say that, um, and I, I don't necessarily say this to Cam, but because you're here, Ali, you know, there's, uh, I've been following you guys for years, all right? So it's really interesting to um, to be here in your presence, you know, um, and noticing these, these arisings for me as well. I think what you're doing is just beautiful. Uh, you, you're really authentic people and... And you're using, you're using where you've been to create a platform to be of service to others. And, you know, that's, that's, um, that's, that's what this world is requiring. And, and you, are, you are meeting it as well in your own beautiful ways. So, um, yeah, I feel really privileged, blessed. Uh, thank you, Cam. Thank you, Ali, for uh, creating this. And... Um, yeah, I look forward to uh, continuing this journey with you guys in whatever capacity that is. Thanks, right. Maurice. Thanks, Thank mate. You. Cool. <laughs> now you've met Maurice Harvey Hall, honey. I have. How'd I that have. go? Well, he lived up to all the all the things that you've said about him. Mm. Um, yeah, just got all goosebumpy talking to him. Mm. He's so lovely. He's a great bloke, and yeah. uh, you can contact Maurice through the mymensteam.org uh, website and he's got his book out, The Art of Intentional Living, at his website which we'll put in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We'll be back with another installment next week. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for listening.